everybody, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. My name is AJ Hannenberg, and I am joined by two of my illustrious and good-looking colleagues, wow. Graham Donaldson. Am I illustrious or good-looking? Or good <laughs> yeah, one is one, one's the other, uh, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I didn't say that both of you had received equal measures. Oh, um, and fair. Thomas Magby. Yeah, present. I, I feel like Graham wins in both categories, so <laughs> good on you, Graham. I guess uh, YouTube can decide. Yeah, for YouTube us, right? can actually yeah, see sure. us, so they can right. tell. Mm. Uh, so, welcome to our podcast. Yeah, we didn't pod- think about that with the whole camera thing, did we? The fact that we are that we faces all- for radio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, I, also that I dress for radio <laughs> and <laughs> deport You're, my comport myself during the about? podcast. Hey, Today you, I look good because yeah, I had to show up for right. work. Usually I'm in like pajama pants. Do you remember that you showed up barefoot with pajama pants? And I had flip flops. And you, I think you hadn't had a haircut in like a year. Or and something. I hadn't showered. Oh my gosh. That was anyway. The dude abides. The dude <laughs> yes. abides. Yes. Indeed. Yes, he does. <laughs> anyway, we're a podcast about the classical world. We talk about old books, old ideas, philosophy, theology, art. Uh, I got another art one coming soon. And anything that kind of strikes our interest that is old and would be considered classical. So yeah, old mm. stuff. Just finished Plato, um, moving, we finished some patronage too, and we're moving on to a new topic, and Graham assures me that the person he's talking about today looked either like a frog or turtle <laughs> later in life. It's true, when he got older, he did. He and so good. that's the controversy I assume we're talking about yes. for the rest yes, of the, the podcast, hour, is right. yeah. frog or turtle, mm-hmm. that's the question. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's going to be one of those internet votes, where uh, it's like yes. frog or turtle, and you just pick which one it was. I'm okay yes. with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Um, the person we are, the classical thing that we were talking about today, it's almost like a classical thing. I wish we didn't have to know, uh, but it's a classical thing to know. Uh, you should know uh, a man, a political theorist uh, by the name of Antonio Gram- Gramsci. Uh, he's Italian, uh, political theorist, and a c- 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 communist. Um, well, what was that? It's, just, it's like uh, I don't know, a little communist thing. But he's <laughs> so he <laughs> was. It's a communist thing. Yeah, I like that. Communist political stuff theorist, you know, Marxist a, political theorist at the turn of the century. And the, you're probably saying, like, so why are we learning about this guy? Um, his political philosophy was kind of a bedrock for a movement in political philosophy that sort of has a lot of uh, sort of has had a lot of staying power and is uh, definitely in the conversation uh, in sort of the landscape today. So um, is this post-Marx, pre-Marx? So post-Marx. So he was um, born the, to the wards the end of the 19th century, died in mm-hmm. the 1930s. Yeah. And he was a communist under fascist Italy. So mm. the communists and fascists don't get along very well. Right. And I believe he was either executed or he was definitely in jail for a long time. And um, what's the fascist Italian name? Uh, Mussolini. Yeah. Mussolini? Mussolini did not like um, Gramsci. Um, but he was like a public figure during his life. He was a public figure yeah, during his popular. life. Okay. Um, um, Soviet, Russia, during well, the Mussolini revolution. Mussolini didn't do anything to him? Hmm? Mussolini didn't do anything to him during his life? If you, if, I feel like if Mussolini doesn't like you, th- bad things are well, going to happen He was in jail. Oh, okay. And most of his writings were called, they just, if you find his writings, they're just called like letters from prison or something. It sounds okay. bad. He was in prison for like 11 years at the end of his life. Yeah. Does, yeah. does not sound good. Yeah. But throughout the, the, yeah. So he, you know, was full into the whole Marxist communist thing of the, right. of the early 20th century, um, was hailed as a little bit of a hero in Russia. Um, but he kind of answered a, or put to, towards an answer of a really burning, big burning question in Marxism. And that is why hasn't this happened elsewhere. So I guess maybe we should back up a little bit and say like, what are the salient features of Karl Marx's political thought? How would you, how would we like sum up? Workers rise up and seize the means of production. Yeah. So there's a division, an economic division between those who own and those who work. Work, Right. So class conflict is the way of understanding history. That's right. So it's a class conflict. And then um, in places that class conflict is going to be where the workers will rise up. The workers are the proletariat and they will rise up against their bourgeoisie overlords and seize the means of productions and move society towards a communal aspect, hence the name. Would someone, um, would, would people want to draw a distinction between Marxism and communism? If you're, I've, I mean, I th- maybe you, what, what would be the, I, I might get this wrong cause I get lots of things wrong. As an anarcho primitive. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That is how I started at least half of my sentences. <laughs> Uh, my flirtation with anarcho-primitivism was a long time ago, but um, that Marxism is the analytical tools of viewing things through a materialist class conflict lens. Like that is mm-hmm. the way to understand history. Communism is the then 
application. Sure. To oh, say, the political yes. out, out of therefore, therefore, because we've had class conflict, now we should move into a utopia that is without this conflict. Dogma and practice, if yeah, you want to say sure. it that yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, when you say, you're saying anarcho-primitivism. Yeah. I thought you said narco primitivism. Nope. nope. Which different. to me no, it sounds like a lot of poppies. <laughs> like doing a lot of drugs uh, in, a, in a camping uh, no. situation. That's what that sounds like. No, uh, uh, an, an arc, no. Yeah. A, yeah. Anarchist plus primitivism. I'm a narco primitivist. <laughs> There's like one journal that like publishes articles about it. Really? And I don't know how they organize themselves. Like, that's my <laughs> always my question. Like, how does Do this, they have an editorial board? That's my thing. Of, like, is there someone, a printing press? That's my or? thing. Like someone is printing this and, and distributing it, and I don't know how they structure themselves. I just have lots of questions. Um <laughs> anyway. So yeah, okay, that's really good. So then you've got the you've got the the doxy and the praxis or you've got the you've got the doctor the dogma and the practice so yeah. the dogma being marxism and the practice being communism right. and there's probably other practices of marxism than communism sure. but yeah. i don't i'm not too well versed in it i don't know but anyway so he was coming in and he was answering a question of well why didn't the proletariat rise up against against their overlords um why did it, one, why did it only happen in Russia, which is a really interesting question, which I don't think we're going to have time to talk about. He had an answer for it. Um, and, but the, the question was, every, th- this is something that blew my mind. Everybody kind of thought it was going to happen in England right. or it was going to happen in Germany, mainly England because they had had such a boom in factories. They had mm-hmm. such a boom in the industrial world. With pretty rough conditions, right? With pretty rough conditions yeah. that when everyone sort of like looked at the heat map of where they thought the communist explosion was going to be, everyone thought England because right. you had this big gap between the owners of the factories and these really crappy conditions. And so everyone was like, well, those proletariat are going to like lose their minds and mm. rise up. And it didn't happen. Right. And so Gramsci tried to answer this question. Um, and so um, so one sort of basic tenet that I think is interesting to understand about Gramsci and his political philosophy, and I guess Marxism in general, is that it really it, – it's a materialistic as its foundation. Right. So everything is just matter and energy, or as I like to – or as I always talk about it in when I'm talking about materialism. Stuff in the fluff? Uh, I always say electric meat. Ah, so it's just okay. like, it's just like, yeah, meat and electricity. Right. Like that's, that's what the world is. And, um, <laughs> I feel like that'd be a great t-shirt. Electric meat. The world is just electric meat. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's like, what the world that's is. That's <laughs> sort of basically the material. If you just have a strict worldview. materialism, right. that's, that's sort of what you're saying. Right. Um, and so Gramsci's introduction into this, into the political thought landscape was, okay, so why didn't it happen in England? And his answer was it didn't happen in England because or in any of these countries because everybody kind of generally believed the same thing about society. Um, there was a, a, a what he called the hegemony. There was a, 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 a everybody kind of looked at the world the same way. You had this cultural hegemony. And uh, Gramsci's position was that when you have a cultural hegemony, um, uh, everything sort of orders itself that way, and you're not actually going to have the change that he wanted to have unless you had some sort of like fissure or breaking of that hegemony. So a cultural hegemony um, uh, sort of has these two pla- these two s- sort of s- platforms, or these, these, these two things. One was the actual, um, what he called the substrate, and the substrate was just the economic world. So the proletariat, the factory workers... For us, the substrate, you know, the economic world is that, you know, we get jobs, we get salaries, we have taxes, uh, we can own houses, you know, that, that's sort of our economic substrate. Um, there's people who um, have debt, people that don't have debt, people that own things, people that rent things. Um, and so that's the economic substrate. Um, and then on top of that is what he calls a superstructure. Maybe it sounds cooler in Italian. I don't know. Um, superstructure sounds pretty cool too. Yeah. Though. yeah. So he has a superstructure, and that is the sort of the driver of culture. So in here you find art and school and the myth of your people and law, philosophy, science, education, uh, to sum up ideology. Mm-hmm. So, so so culture societies have the economic thing on the bottom and for marxists the economic was always the engine always the driver Mm. but then on top of that you have this this superstructure that um kind of regulates or keeps uh keeps that thing in in check um um so um so everything is sort of in this 
is is in this ideology. So then, just sort of, to sort of put the quick little uh, end to his uh, to his thought on this, is that um, the superstructure is built explicitly in a way that some people are going to benefit over the exploitation of other people. Yes. So this is the so this is so the, the very sort of structure of society is built in a way where the art, the music, the law, the philosophy, even the science and education, the myth, the founding myth of a uh, of the Italian people or whatever, right? Um, or of of Western Europe because this is the context that they're in. All of that has been f- calculated and created f- that those who are the oppressors can keep their power, and those who are the oppressed. Um, are always sort of under the, the the heel of the oppressors, but everybody's just like ah, that's just the way it is. Or uh, the ones the phrase that um, Graham she really liked to use is he says everybody just says it's common sense. Mm. Well, it's common sense that we have factories. Well, mm. it's just common sense. This is the best way to do it. And that's and so on the factory part in particular, that's the. Um I'm going to get my two terms wrong. It's superstructure on top and what's yep. on bottom. Superstructure is the ideology, and then the substrate is just the economic prin- the economic engine. So the substrate is just assumed to always be the way it is. So yep. people are just complacent. They accept it. That's right. Yeah. And everyone's sort of, well, ah, not only is everybody complacent, but uh, within this political philosophy, there is a strong view of like historical context, historical determinism. That your place in time and history determines everything about you. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, AJ, what determines everything about you is the fact that you were born in 1983, 4, 5? Five. 5. 5, okay. You are born in 85, you are born in Spokane, um, you're male, you're American, all of these things. Uh, you, you, hmm. Your parents had their specific jobs, your specific historical context, um, the education that you had, everything... De- is sort of determined who you are and what you think and what you feel about the world. Um, that there is no human nature that reaches, that can get out from that context. Mm-hmm. So that any, there's nothing else that can sort of reach beyond um, that if, in, if uh, and the only reason that you get along with the people around you is because they're sort of in the same contexts and if you're lucky enough to get along along with somebody who's from a completely different culture or nation, um, it has to do with all of these sort of accidents. There's no, there's no sort of like unifying human nature apart from context. Does this make sense? Yes, it does. I mean, it, it makes sense what he's saying. And there's something to. Uh, it matters what year you're born in. It matters yeah. that influences what ideas you'll be exposed to. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a part of that that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, so far, I've, I take three beefs. All right, let's hear your beefs. Uh, one beef is that culture, he says culture is designed to make sure the people at the top play by a different set of rules than the people at the bottom. Yeah. I think that's a causation fallacy. Okay. I think our culture will result in certain people benefiting over other people. But I don't know that, like, the people at the top designed culture that way and perpetuate it just because they're at the top. I think that's a natural result well, of, like, I, th- I think the common mm-hmm. assumption came first mm-hmm. that it's just common sense. And then the people in power came second. I think it's more likely than the people in power getting together and like, let's do it this way. Hatching it from the beginning. Yeah, maybe. Because it shifts, right? When there was a big shift in the Industrial Revolution, new people came to power that hadn't been in power before. Mm -hmm. And so culture prior to power. Yeah. So it's, um, uh, I agree with you that it sort of, it gives a pretty simplistic and primitive view of like history. it's, It's using... It, so it's using, um, like, if you went in and actually looked at the the history of political thought in England versus having like a cartoon version. Yeah. So that's kind of what he what feels he feels cartoony. So I feel this. I think this is ultimately the criticism of Gramsci is that he ends up presenting cartoon versions of uh, of things or really big over generalizations as the vehicle for his ultimate goal, which is a communist revolution or which is a Marxist overthrowing. True. Yeah. Um, the. The two other quick beefs. Mm-hmm. One of them is that, yeah, I think your context probably determines pretty much what, what you are, but that doesn't make it wrong, mm-hmm. right? It's like pointing out that, ah, you only know math because your parents were mathematicians is because they taught it in school. Mm-hmm. Does that make math incorrect? Mm-hmm. No, it doesn't. That doesn't necessarily reduce the value of the person just by pointing it out that their context makes it, right? Mm-hmm. Just by pointing out the process by which something is made or comes to be 
has doesn't necessarily have a total bearing yeah. on its value. And it seems like he is assuming he is assuming that it does, right? Now, that we should resist wrong. the culture. It is wrong if the superstructure that you're getting taught was created for the benefit of the powerful, right? Like, so and, if, if the first thing is true, then the whole contextual argument of people right. b- being born into this and being sort of propagandized into this way of thinking about the world. Then it's someone then else it forcing their position sure. on you. And I think it relies heavily on that third assumption that there's no overarching human experience, but even by his own reasoning, like, yes, if my context and culture determines who I am, then there's a certain common context between all of mankind. We mm-hmm. all experience things in a similar way. We have similar bodies. We have similar needs like Mm -hmm. there is a common thread through all of mankind and that is part of the context that determines us Mm -hmm. and so simply saying that there's like there's no common human experience is discounting his own evidence i think yeah um um, those all make sense i I feel like i I don't have yet a grasp enough on is is this the entirety of kind of his core Um, i like to get cranky cranky as early as possible (laughs) which is fine that's what makes it fun uh well, I guess his his point is that like the bourgeois and the proletariat both buy into the cultural hegemony, yeah, and uh, and everyone just sort of thinks it's common sense, but it's not common sense. It's power structures, and therefore there needs to be a very explicit counter hegemony in order to bring about um, a, a just or right change. Um, and so if you so then you. Um, so this is why the communist revolution or the Marxist revolution failed in England is because they had the cultural hegemony of what it means to be a British, mm. what it means to be, uh, you know, a British person. And the common British worker had an idea mm. of it and the British lord had an idea of it and the British factory owner had an idea of it. And they all could understand why the other person and how the other person existed and they were all more or less cool with it. Not that they, not that the British worker who... Um, um, who was maybe exploited, didn't say like, man, I wish I wasn't exploited. Right. But um, I guess what Gramsci is saying is that eventually when he sort of like, uh, when um, if you keep, if you ask that British worker, uh, what, were, what are you going to do about it? Eventually he's going to get to some sort of phrase where he says, well, we just, that's just not what you do. Right. Um, well, why don't you... Um, well, why don't you blow up your factory? Well, you know, I don't want to kill anybody. Well, why don't you want to kill anybody? You know, like, well, right. because there's, uh, because it would be wrong to kill, uh, to kill somebody. Sounds so, like they're eventually reaching just the Tao, like the basic human yes, notion yeah. of what's right and wrong. True. And because this Sorry, is, if you're a new listener, that's a, that was C.S. Lewis's way of explaining the common human notion of the rule of what is right and acceptable versus what is wrong and unacceptable that he thinks spans all yes. cultures. So I think that Gramsci, when Lewis talks about the Tao and he says that Nietzsche is talking about, is trying to create a new Tao, Gramsci definitely is creating a uh, political philosophy that rejects the idea of Tao. Right. And really brings it into more of a pragmatic, almost Machiavellian. He quotes Mac, uh, Machiavelli a lot, along with Marx in his work, uh, that it's it really just comes down to Uh, the pragmatic and that um, the culture of one's day is not um, what it means to be a human person or, I mean, he really is coming up against uh, sort of the classical or not even the classical, the enlightenment world. Um, And so there's definitely a sort of interesting, uh, um, he's going up against the enlightenment world that takes, you know, um, that, that, that has a theory of, Natural, that has a theory of natural law, um, um, classical views of justice, um, and says like, well, the only reason everyone thinks that is just because that's that's the useful cultural hegemony that keeps the powerful in power. Sure. Which is AJ's point of it's attributing a reason whether it's actually true or not mm-hmm. it, without delving into is it a good system that is set up. Mm-hmm. Thinking back to your government episode from however long ago that was, it's a totally different view. It's instead of a good government is established and we're trying to maintain that, it's Mm -hmm. we're fighting to fix, right, what has always been broken. So in that sense, it's not just a view of owners and workers, but it's it it actually the categories get extended to oppressors and the oppressed. Right. Um, And then. Uh, Gramsci's solution is that you need to go and gather a basket of the oppressed and they can be impressed, oppressed in all sorts of different ways and they can be all sorts of uh, uh, oppressed for all sorts of different reasons and then together they come and they 
uh, try to forge some sort of counter hegemony to to take down the system. Um, and so, um, but this doesn't actually happen, does it? The founding of that counter hegemony, or it never gets to a large enough size to yeah. matter. Yeah. So the communist. So this is maybe this is where we can talk about Russia. So the communist revolution that happens in Russia, people people said to Gramsci, "Hey, man, so why did it happen there?" Um, and it didn't happen in England. And his answer was, well, there wasn't enough of a cultural hegemony cohesion between Mm. the ruling class, so like the SARS and the landowners, and the actual people that overthrow. So this is kind of the the funny thing about about Marxism or about communism, is that communism thinks, or the Marxist revolution thinks it's going to be the proletariat that overthrows the bourgeoisie, Mm. but it's always the like, disenfranchised bourgeoisie that overthrows the franchise bourgeoisie, right. right? Like it's not a, it's not a workers rebe- rebellion. Right. Uh, the people who took over Russia in the workers rebellion were not like farmers and factory workers. It was university students, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so it was like the young bourgeoisie who don't have a place in the old bourgeoisie system yeah. um, say, well, the whole system is, uh, the whole system is a problem. And so we need a counter system to sort of overthrow the system. So, yeah. Um, Gramsci says, then what, um, then instead of trying to go to factory workers and convince factory workers that they need to like take up arms against their, their, um, their overlords is you're going to come up to a factory worker. Who's like a good Catholic. Who's like, you know, I just don't, you know, uh, you know, God put this, you know, I submit to the authorities under me and Gramsci's revolutionaries be like, oh man, this isn't going to work. Um, um, what we need to do, if we're going to get the proletariat to get out of the cultural hegemony, we need then, therefore, the revolution starts by going into the organs of culture. So instead of having the proletariat mm. overthrow, so we don't go at, we don't go for the substrate. We don't care about the economics of the situation mm. like Marx did. We go for the superstructure. Um, and so then you should have these little uh, Gramsciites or whatever going into the art and the school and the myth of, of the people, the storytellers, the laws, the philosophy, the science, and the education. So he says, you know, you have people who, um, uh, whose job it is to, is to present a counter-narrative, right, to the, to the prevailing narrative, since everything is just a game of narrative and oppression, right. to present a counter-narrative, and then eventually when that counter-narrative gets more and more and more foothold, well then the common sense for the proletariat shifts. And then what's common sense for the proletariat not being, I don't know, violent or reactionary is now like, oh, maybe we should do this sort of thing. So, you know, but if you think like 19, no, animal farm, Mm. right? Like boxer the horse is the proletariat. Right. And, uh, you know, boxer the horse isn't convinced about this, Mm -hmm. Um, but he goes along with it because the pigs who are the disenfranchised bourgeoisie um, you know, kind of, yeah, get Boxer on board. Right. But it's not, it's not coming from Boxer. Is that the name of the horse, Boxer? Do yes, you Boxer's the yes. horse. Oh, okay. yeah. I had a student write a story where he died and then became glue in the bottom of her backpack. Oh, yeah. well, sad. Because he goes to a glue factory. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. He is killed. And that, I, I yes. wondered if that okay. played into the story, too, of eventually it's not, it's not about the worker, right? The worker's, never, worker yeah, suffers. It's not yeah, about right. the worker. At least, and this is, I mean, there's lots of criticisms of Gramsci, but one of the criticisms of Gramsci is this. It's that, like, this isn't, this is not a system of, like, enfranchising the poor man. This is um, uh, a system of enfranchising the intellectuals who aren't in the intellectual citadel, Mm. right? Right. Um, And so, um, and so then, but, you know, and he, but he was saying, like, yeah, but if you want to, if you want to change the system, like you do this, you don't go and you don't mm. try to like, you know, um, rile up the fact the, the coal workers in right. Northern England, you don't, you know, go to that, rile up the, the coal workers in Northern England, you go and you get a bunch of true believers into Start like, writing the newspapers articles. or yeah, the newspapers yeah. are making films about it or blog write, it up. Yeah. Blog it up, uh, writing music, that but kind of is thing. Is the purpose not to then impact the substrate? So by taking... You mean this? Yeah, substrate. Yes. No, I, I do. So mm-hmm. you, you start with a superstructure, but isn't the purpose of that superstructure to change minds? Yes, to eventually alter the yes. substrate. You're saying this is just a question of tactics. You start with the superstructure, but then the end goal is still people to oh, for there to be an overthrow. Yes, right? yeah. The end goal is right. still that is is that overthrow. Utopia. Right. Sure. Um, um, 
unless those disenfranchised bourgeoisie then get into power right. and then are the new power and then just keep it, mm. right? Like, um, so then, you know, the, in, instead of, so once they get to be the editors of a major newspaper or whatever, um, instead of then using that for the struggle, the mm. real struggle, it's just like, okay, well now, now you know, um, instead of, Instead of getting a promotion of uh, you know working in a in an institution, I sort of have done it through uh, through force. Mm. Um, I guess is a way to put it. Um, um, I don't know too much about this. This this m- plus a bunch of other political philosophy is what has made up what's called critical theory yep. in uh, the, in sort of the modern philo- uh, political theory. Um, I know that Gramsci isn't himself like. This is this isn't solely all of the political theory because there's like a Frankfurt School I think mm. which I don't know anything about and there's all sorts of other things in there um, but this is but what I find fascinating is like yeah um, is compare this to the government of the Middle Ages for example so the man the the king and the peasant in the Middle Ages believed that they were taking part in a harmonious system right that was orchestrated through a, almost like a divine hierarchy. And so the king was king because God had him king. He was born king. Mm-hmm. And the peasant is peasant because that is his lot in life. And yes, there could be, uh, the wheel of fortune could turn so that the king could be a happy king or a crappy king. Right. You could The peasant could have a wonderful life or a, a life of hardship. So there was uh, volatility in the, uh, in the life of, of the individual person. But we were always taught in the Middle Ages, like, there's not a whole lot of social mobility. At least that's what I was right. told, right? Yes, same. And this is part of it. There's not a lot of social mobility because the idea of social mobility was that disruption was calling into question the sort of the harmony of of the— of, of The order. The right? order. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, but uh, I think we currently misunderstand that that order was perpetrated— by the kings to keep the serfs in place. Whereas like, but that's the thing. We just, we just finished my podcast on Plato where he basically lays out why a philosopher king is the best way to do things. Mm -hmm. Why the people at the bottom should be working at the bottom. Why the people that are the warriors should be the warriors. Why the king should be the king. And you also have old myths, the sword of Damocles. It sucks being king. Mm -hmm. People want to kill you when you're king. You have all kinds of worries that a farmer doesn't have. Right. Mm -hmm. So, we, we make the assumption that, number one, being king is awesome. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's true. Mm-hmm. And number two, that being at the bottom is a terrible life. If you have a decent lord that isn't horrible to you, and you can just farm and run your farm how you want to, like, that's a wonderful yes. life. Yep. In fact, that's the life that Odysseus chose at the end of, it, of uh, um, okay. and the Republic. The Republic. Right. Exactly. And so for us to sort of, like, backshop <laughs> our, our attitudes onto the medieval world and say, like, oh, those poor peasants— is to discount, right, what all of them believed was that, like, yeah, one man should rule. It means that he can get a lot done. If he's a philosopher king, it means we are in an incredible country. Mm-hmm. And who wants to be king? Being king is a nightmare, mm-hmm. right? But if he sucks, we're all going to suck. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So there's there's the yeah. there's a king at the top, but there's also tyranny at the bottom, right? Yeah. It's like a reverse picture. So as sort mm-hmm. of modern people who live at the tail end of the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of whatever you want to call this, the digital revolution. We look at that and we say, oh man, that sucks because you don't have the opportunity for vast financial growth that one can have. Or, or you know, right. like you look at that and you say, without social mobility, what's the point of living? And, right. <laughs> and, um, and the person in the Middle Ages would, you know... Uh, um, um, would say like, your ambition is the thing that you live for? Exactly. Right. Like why... Um, why are you trying to do that? Like yes. there, there are so many other things to live for. Yeah. One's family, now, the church. Sure. Now, not to overly romanticize the past because right. there's, there's tremendous upside to living in a technological world where, yep. you know, we don't have polio. And there were a lot of people that wanted to be king and killed and each tried, other to do it. And right? killed people to do it. Absolutely. But generally speaking, when you're talking about um, – but I think the, the biggest different di- differentiator is that in that old view and even in certain sense in the, in the Enlightenment view – there is a, an idea that it's not just a materialism that's driving everything. So we need to take either the eternity of the soul or we need to take the, 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 the spiritual world, the fact that human beings are a body-soul composite, and that should be baked into our not only 
That should be baked into our government structure. Uh, you definitely have that in the Middle Ages. In the Enlightenment, you have... If you're cynical, you would say that the Enlightenment wanted the fruit of the Christian society without the trunk hmm. or without, like, the belief. That's probably the cynical way so of they, framing they spent the Enlightenment. Their, they spent their time digging the roots out from under the tree. Yeah, they but wanted— But they still had the tree in the middle of the They wanted the life that came from that, whole, that, that system being yeah. whole, but they didn't want to accept the dogma. So they wanted— They're like, the, I love sitting under this tree, but gosh, these roots are just yeah. making it uncomfortable mm-hmm. for my bum. So let's get rid of the roots and keep the tree. Or they wanted the, um, yeah, they, they, they wanted the, the goodness that comes out of the praxis, but they didn't want the doxy or they didn't want the yeah. doctrine that went around. What time period it. did you say that was? That the Enlightenment? You said Enlightenment. Enlightenment that, yeah, and, uh, and moving into sort of like 16th, 17th, 18th, you know, and then I mean, you get It, it, to it the, extends for a long time. Then you get, right. yes. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Well, yeah. In many ways, what's happening sort of in the digital world is sort of almost the end of the Enlightenment. And of course, everyone in newspapers are talking about uh, the end of the liberal order or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like what, I mean, say what you will of Nietzsche, but the dude was a prophet. He's He realized sure. early what right. was happening. And he's yeah. like, look, when we dissociate ourselves from God, we lose everything. Yeah. Like yeah. all values are going to need to be mm-hmm. revalued. And I think what, what he kind of predicted is coming true. And so now Gramsci's like, good, you've gotten yourself out from God. Here's the playbook of like mm. for the unenfranchised to become enfranchised and to, and to have power. So, but I mean, the, so it's a, it's a skill, it's a tool book mm. or it's a skill set. But even then, like mm. to what end? To the end that I have power and cash. I mean, I guess it's the end of self-actualization, but that assumes that the people at the bottom have no power to self-actualize. The, the noble end would be that you're doing this for the poor man or for the oppressed man. The cynical reading of it would be that you're doing this because um, if, there, if, if skills do in some way... Um, or if being able to do something can correlate into wealth or power, then those who have nothing other than anger or, you know, or mobilization, uh, this is the way that they can sort of like have the seat at the table. And that's the more cynical way of reading it. So even, even with the charitable way, if we're doing this for the poor man, like, so in the, what's the end? The end is that we overthrow the oppressors and that then everyone is absolutely equal? Is the end equality communism yeah. like the equality yeah, I mean, of communism? I mean, um, I think uh, one of the things that everybody who is part of the disenfranchised bourgeoisie who wants to take over the enfranchised bourgeoisie, if they don't have a unity of thought of what that system is going to be, or if they, or more dangerously, if they have the anything is better than this mentality, then that's a real dangerous place to be because yeah. there are things worse than the Middle Ages, or there are things worse than. Whatever the curl, current An hegemony, if you, right? if, you, if you want to talk about it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yes. Um, so I, I just, yeah, the... Um, so there are problems with this view because it boils things down. It oversimplifies. It, makes, it oversimplifies. It, it has a strong sort of view of the, the determinism of, of your historical context. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, basically it's like, control the hegemony, control the world. That's kind of his, his view on it. Um, and that's, that's, yeah. Uh, um, he, and he wanted to sort of see this happen in Italy. And then you can sort of see how, um, uh, what fascinates me is that fascism and, and Marxism are, are really two sides of the same coin. Um, in this movie, that's a whole other podcast, but, um, anyway, how much, what's, what's, what's our time stamp like here? Uh, you have 30 more minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so the this sort of um, way of thinking about the world makes its way into theology. It, theology always is a trailing theology. Theology always trails like the world. <laughs> mm. No, theology always trails philosophy. Um, so philosophical things that happen in the 18th century. Our 19th century often find themselves in, fi- sort of work their way into the theology of the 20th century. You can sort of see this going all the way back. Um, the uh, really the theology of the Protestant Reformation comes from a lot of the political philosophy of like 100 years before it and mm. stuff, um, and the heresies that came before it. Um, that's a whole other podcast. 
But um, so this happens all the time in uh, in theology is that theology is always trailing philosophy. So this philosophy f- um, sort of find its finds its way in to Western Christianity. So to Christianity in um, in yeah in Europe and in, in North America, and it first finds its way in Catholic theology. So Catholic theology often is a little bit more sensitive um, to philosophy than Protestant theology. Um, I don't know why that is, but, but by sensitive, I mean like picks up on it faster and has kind of like a higher adoption rate of taking a, taking a philosophy and trying to work out a, a, a Christian theology around it or, or you are explaining it in light of, of, of the Christian texts. Um, so, and this, uh, I don't know too much about this, but this does um, sort of bear kind of an interesting thing that I think, if I may make a bold prediction about the future, so let me, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. So this kind of thinking about the world that Gramsci has works its way into some Catholic theology of the early to mid 20th century that f- generally gets its name called liberation theology. Now- not all liberation theology is um, Marxist, or not all liberation theology sort of is using a tool book that comes from a, a, a materialist worldview or materialist way of viewing, viewing the universe. But a whole, but a lot of it is, and a lot of that uh, Catholic theo- that Catholic liberation theology found a place of expression in places where there were lots of Marxist revolutions going on. So mainly Latin America in the early 20th century, early mid 20th century. So I, you, hmm? you might get into this later, but um, isn't there a fundamental disagreement if Marxism is a materialist philosophy and religion kind of by definition has a spiritual component to it? So this ends up being the criticism, actually the famous, the famously the criticism that Cardinal Ratzinger, before he became Pope, oh. he wrote a lot about the problems oh. of, of this liberation theology being... He says the only way that it can be used in actuality is if you kind of have to become full Marxist for, to buy it. And oh. to become full Marxist, you end up having to like think of a materialist universe. Right. Um, so therefore, it can't really have any coalescence or coherence with Christian Christianity. dogma. Right. Um, and then a lot of the um, liberation theologians' response were like, fine, maybe, but it still works. That- <laughs> so... You're, you're painting a different picture than I'm used to for liberation theology. And if this is too in the weeds, sorry. No, this, this is interesting because I, I, I don't feel like I, I myself have a, a firm. I, I have. I'm yeah, I think so. I think I think one way of telling the story is Marxism infiltrated the church. Therefore, they combined into um, liberation theology. Mm-hmm. The more charitable. Yes. In the way someone who actually believes that would say it, I I believe is more akin to saying that the story of Exodus is one that is told over and over again through time, Mm -hmm. that there are oppressors, there are oppressed, God sides with the oppressed to free them. That's Mm -hmm. the story we see in Exodus. Um, And in some senses, what happens with Christ, it's the conquering of death, which is this oppression. So this is good because this all comes down to the central problem. And that central problem is not the doxy, not the belief, but the actual then oh, the practice out. of it. Okay. Yeah. So the so there's a so there's orthodoxy, but then there's is there an orthopraxis when it comes to this sort of thing. So this is Theref- the interesting thing. Therefore, so, we should topple oppressors. So yeah. So here's the here's the sort of the charitable, or if you wanted to give the biblical attempt to flesh out this kind of philosophy, you would say that the cross of Christ is God siding with the victim. Mm-hmm. Yes. The oppressed. Yes. The oppressed. Yes. And the Christian needs to side with the oppressed Mm -hmm. um, because God does. Mm -hmm. And insofar as the Christian is the oppressor, the Christian needs, those two things are are mutually exclusive. And so the Christian needs to lay down their rights or their privileges as an oppressor Mm -hmm. to take up side next to the oppressed. Okay. So that's the, maybe the, 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 the dogma, uh, that was even getting into praxis at the end. Right. So the dogma would be God sides with the oppressed and the Christian must side with the oppressed. Um, that's the, 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 the dogma. Yes. The praxis then becomes a real sticky and thorny issue. Yes. Because um, one version of that telling is the only way that a man can, and this is the version that I, I disagree with, the only way that a man or a woman or a Christian can repent 
and actually then be in God's kingdom and have repentance is that they lay down their oppressive their their they, they lay down their whatever their uh, tool their, of oppression their tools of oppression are, are yeah. and take up the cause of the oppressed and that is the, and that is the way that you atone for for your sins and that and that is the way that you that you repent the reason i have a problem with that is that now you've turned the um conversion of the soul and you've and you've turned the 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 um, uh, Christian repentance into a, it has to be a political action. Mm. There's now, you have An to do political things. Yeah. Now, the reason why we as Christians, especially modern Christians, get our, our shorts in a wad about this is because there was a huge division, definitely in the Protestant church, between two ways of thinking about this when it came to justice and when it came to um, uh, what do Christians do in light of the difficulties of the world. Um, and there was a split. I don't really know when, when the split happened, but I can sort of give color to the split as someone who's lived, who's lived in Protestant Christianity my whole life. This is sort of seeing it from the inside. So the split is, generally speaking, the mainline denominations took on the mantle of your faith must be worked out in action. And if that's political action, so be it. Um, it so it is, a, it is a, you have to work it out in the political sphere that the Christian mm-hmm. has to be... Um, uh, a worker in for the justice of the oppressed. And if that means, you know, doing X, Y, or Z specific example of that, then that is what the Christian must do. That is the orthopraxis. So that is, um, that is the mainline uh, route. And they, and the mainline sort of churches have gone down that route. The more, the other route, and this is probably the route that we all grew up in, um, is the doubling down on the personal conversion, mm-hmm. the Billy Graham route. It's like, no, it all has to do with a, a strong, strong, strong belief. And then insofar as that strong belief prompts you to act, then you can go and do charitable acts mm-hmm. of good work. Um, but those charitable acts of good work don't prove or don't do anything. They just are what you're supposed to be doing. And that's where that sort of split came from. But, as I mean, I think we know or we you know, the book of James is so challenging in this because it's talking about, you know, faith without works is dead and works without faith is, what does it call it? Uh, I think you make this stuff up as you go. Mm-mm. Faith without works is dead. It is a dead faith and works with no faith is like, you know, vain or something. Um, you have to sort of marry the doxy and the, and the praxis together. Yep. Um, and so then the big question is, and this was the big question in the Catholic Church that Ratzinger wrote, about, wrote against was, is proper Catholic action, orthopraxis is the word, mm-hmm. is it siding with those who are trying to, who say that they are bringing power to the disenfranchised through social revolution? So that's the big question. So there's tons of bishops in Latin America that were like, yes, we got poor people, and if and if the people in power are not going to uh, help the poor people, then we're gonna. I'm gonna use my influence as as a church to do this. This is orthopraxis, and um, and Ratzinger's response to that was: This actually isn't the way that we should be talking about salvation in the gospel. It's not through um, political action. It's it's through the cross of Christ. So that's that's a thorny thing, and in, in some sense, it feels like you are now splitting hairs, mm-hmm. and. Um, Ooh, I've got opinions. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, so all of this, if, if I'm to understand— Anyway, just before we, we, we yeah, get into your opinions, just so we can sort of trace <laughs> where we're at, is this, so this is Gramsci, not a Christian, not, nor, not a theologian, um, someone who has a atheistic, moralistic philosophy. That philosophy's toolkit getting adopted in a theological framework and is now uh, in this theological framework in— um, uh, in liberation theology of the early 20th century, and then my prediction about Protestants in the future, but we'll, okay. we'll get there in a second. I think the theological adoption is a bit of a mistake and a simplification of what happened in the Exodus and on the cross, and here's why. So if I understand liberation theology as you've described it, I'm sure that there's probably shades of nuance that we didn't get to, but if you're saying that God went to the Hebrews and freed them from the Egyptians like to bring them freedom— mm-hmm. So first of all, what did he free them into? It wasn't democracy. At best, it can be called another tyranny, right? He made the decisions. He made them wander for 40 years in the desert. Is that the attitude we're supposed to adopt? Free the people and push them into the desert? And if we're talking about 
Christology, Jesus sided with the oppressed. If the oppressed is us, mm-hmm. against who? What oppressor? Ourselves. Yeah. Is that what you're trying so, to say? So either, either it's ourselves, which, which seems like a contradiction. Yeah, I, but, and that's the thing is like, it can't be a contradiction. So therefore he must be siding with us against some other oppressor. And the person who brought death to us yes. as a result was him. So either he is siding with us and we may, we seem to make God a tyrant in both cases. I think if we are to side with the oppressed in this instance, we, we would make a, it would be an incorrect understanding to say that like that is God demonstrating that we need to divide mankind into oppressors and oppressed. Mm-hmm. I think we should see mankind as something that has been saved because that was the action of the cross and that we are to be advocates of all of man. And yes, some people need our advocation more than others, right? Mm-hmm. The, the people who are poor, the people who are sick, but that doesn't mean that we should neglect those who happen to find themselves in positions of power. Not that we should like send money or anything, but just that it doesn't, it is not like his goal was not to drive a wedge. His goal was to ad- redeem all of us. And if we look at Exodus, the goal was not to make Sar- uh, Pharaoh look like a chump. It was to make God look good, to reserve a people that would eventually result in Christ yeah. in a single saving action that saved us all. Saved us all. So, so to say we have to save somebody is to devalue him, his action is what I think. Now you're, you're, yes, there's another key problem in there, and that is that it begins to conflate the idea of sin. So Christ died on the cross not to free us from oppressors like the Romans. Um, Christ died on the cross to free us from the oppression of sin and death. Yes. So once you start to say the sin that you need to atone for is belonging to being oppressor, um, now you've, you've made it a pretty difficult situation because now you've ascribed the sin of the world onto a group of people. So a this select is actually group of people, why, and you're sort of neglecting some that aren't oppression sins, like lust. Yeah, no, but we've I, mm. we hear this, and I think we we probably have heard this even preached about in our churches, which is to hear the phrase "systems can be sinful," and maybe there's some nuance that needs to be teased out of that. But that, but if that's uh, the question, is is that necessarily true? Um, um, I don't know. Maybe I don't want to get into that into that thing. But this is that kind of thought that well, uh, well, you know, maybe you can be a great person, but you're part of a system that's really sinful because you bought a shirt that was made by slave labor or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so um, now you're in this really strange position. Well, is this a sin that I need to repent of? Mm-hmm. Is this a, like and do nothing? Well, if I just sort of like. It, it, if I just sort of pray to God and say, like, I'm sorry that I bought a shirt by slave labor, people are going to be like, well, that's kind of cheap. Right. So the next question is maybe you got to start doing something about it. Sure. So then we're getting into the, okay, so then is is um, um, is that the, the is that the Christian life? Is that we begin to then um, uh, start enacting, start sort of redeeming these sinful systems? Well, sure. what if the only way to redeem the sinful system is to start like cracking heads mm-hmm. of the people that want to keep that system? Yeah. That's when it starts getting real, real sort of squishy here. Sure. Because I mean, that's that's the revolution would be violence. Yeah. But that's many steps removed from if someone came to you and said, I'm really convicted of the evils of slave labor and, uh, and textile production, and they are going to buy locally sourced, you, you know yeah. what I mean? You wouldn't begrudge them that. Like, no. And in some sense, they're making uh, the world better mm-hmm. in the sense of they're moving money away from a system that enslaves people to one that is um, not, right? Like, I don't know. I know, but we started I, I, seeing I just think weird, there are degrees between these two. We started seeing weird manifestations of this in sort of Christian evangelicalism. Remember Coney 2015? Yep. Do you remember that was? What was that, maybe? The warlord. Was 2015, 2012? I, I thought, Whenever I thought, it was. I thought it was 2012. Maybe it was 2012. Yeah, so Coney was this warlord in Africa who was doing terrible things in the nation that 20, he was in. 2012, yeah. And um, uh, a group of, of uh, sort of group of Christians right. decided that they were going to make him internet famous to try to lever the, lever, uh, or, sorry, twist the arms of power to go in and take care of this warlord, right? That, that was, like, that's, that's right. a fascinating... Right. Pay attention to it so that it could be addressed. Yeah, uh, right? that's a fascinating sort of practice right there. Right. Uh, already, like that, that's just sort of an interesting um, case study in, in thinking about this. But my prediction that I that I sort of mentioned was um, Protestant evangelical Christianity hasn't really th- thought through this, um, this sort of liberation theology. So liberation theology has been bounced around in Catholic thought for a long time and has a lot of ink spilt and a lot of um, sort of... Um, figuring out 
where the Catholic Church stands on this particular issue, and there's people who are out of communion with the Catholic Church over liberation theology and the extent that, you know, it should play into revolutions and government overthrows and all this sort of stuff. Um, um, I worry that um, the the wing of the church that didn't start thinking about works, they thought about um, the sort of the more Billy Graham doubling down on, on um, a personal salvation. Um, hmm, how can I say this? Um, that the, this if, more... if the members of that denomination are not, if they are catechized into a type of faith that revolves around um, more one's personal feelings about things, which is, I think is a really valid criticism of a lot of uh, sort of modern evangelical at least practice, if not theology, our theology is probably fine. You probably go read a theology book from a, from an evangelical theologian and be like, yeah, this stuff's great, good, mm-hmm. do- good theology. Um, but the sort of the way it's played out, at least in churches you know, that I grew up in, and, I, and we've talked a little bit about this on the podcast before, if there is a weakness or if there is sort of like a, um, a fragility in, um, in um, sort of solidly having practice flow out of biblical understanding, something like a liberation theology, um, I think is going to hit uh, Protestant churches hard. I think I, I, I think it's going to come in and there's it's going to be a destabilizing thing. People are going to be like, are going to have to figure out, well, what do we do? How do we frame our, um, how do we frame the, the, the sorrows and sins of the world into how I live my life? And Gramsci gives a political answer Liberation theology gives a theological version of that political answer that I think um, um, I don't want to say it's a Trojan horse, but I, it's, I think it's, it's something that is um, a pretty volatile thing that, um, um, that I don't think lots of people that I don't think is really, yeah, um, understood too much. There's more um, to the worldview than just um, siding with the oppressed. There's again, the materialist angle to it, it's only seeing conflict instead yeah, of seeing yes, order to things. Exactly. That's the Georgian horse portion of it. Yeah. Um, and just one last thing, just uh, to give uh, maybe a little more credence to this. Uh, I'm not a Baptist. I don't know much about Baptists. I don't know very much about the Baptist Southern Baptist Convention. But this was a point of contention in the 2019 Southern Baptist Convention, which was how much should we allow this kind of political thought and um, philosophical, theological uh, toolkit to be used in our Baptist seminaries. So this was an actual proposition that came through. It got passed, um, but there was a lot of opposition to it. So uh, I don't know much about Baptists, but you know the, the biggest denomination or the biggest sort of organized denomination in the U.S. And if they're sort of having conversations about this, then uh, yeah, then I think it's it's going to be something that is a um, a sort of a wing of theology that Protestants haven't thought about for 50 years, but more other mainline denominations have. So mm. anyway, sorry, do you, uh, you have more thoughts, Sandberg? Uh, I have thoughts, but I think they're about the current political climate, which we might want to stray away from. Well, I mean, I think it's a lot of people would be making, would be thinking about the current political well, what climate. I mean is this, but like, the thing is like, what, we don't, yeah. How do we, how do we know what's happening? Well, I'm not, I'm just saying like, when I grew up, churches seemed to be insular. Like yes. the concern from the pulpit was my personal walk with Christ. Yeah. And now I think churches are encountering pressure from the outside to deal with political things that are happening outside of the church doors that have to do with larger groups of people than just the individual. And probably, right? Because probably those groups of people have so. representatives probably, in yeah. the church and outside mm-hmm. of the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that there is only so long pastors can listen and learn before they have to take a stance. Yeah, and, and one of those stances practice. is going to be liberation theology, right? I think that... Yeah, for some. So, so I think just we will probably see this like a, a theology of practice concerning groups and oppressed peoples come to fruition in the next couple of years totally. in churches because, because of that pressure to move it away from concern with an individual walk with Christ. Mm-hmm. But isn't this just a part of a timeline of, yep. so these churches, so Billy Graham, even as an example, you have some form of reform inside the church. It starts a new movement. The movement gets large. It becomes the main line. 
a new reformer comes along. Like, isn't this just... Yes. Yeah. Th- I think that's a hopeful way of phrasing it, right. is that, like, this maybe is coming in and breathing a little life into some of the rot, right. or uh, is coming in and pointing out uh, some blind spots, right? We've talked about cultural blind spots before. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I, when I said my, you know, churches were insular, in a lot of ways they were insular. Yeah. It was about us rather than being about, like, part of a, a calling is to go and help the poor and the downtrodden. But my, my worry was that... Um, uh, when it becomes a narrative of uh, opposing the oppressor? No, it's more that we're not coming in to um, a lot of uh, a lot of big denominations um, um, haven't done a very adequate job of forming thoughtful Christian thinkers right. and 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 sort of um, uh, biblical literacy. Uh, uh, theological understanding. I, I don't mean like everybody, you know, um, can pass can pass a quiz, but uh, on you know orthodoxy or whatever. But I mean like a real wrestling with like. Okay, I'll give you the example. So um, when is it right to be civilly disobedient? Okay, well there's a there's the the Bible story of give under there's the phrase. Uh, the, the scripture, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. You can use that as a, let the authorities have their authority um, because God is ultimately in control. So, you know, like they're going to do what they do. And so give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And then the other biblical story is God or Jesus flipped over the the the, 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 tables, the tables in the temple because they were exchanging things and profaning God. So which, so those are both biblical. When do you know to apply which one to a, current context of unrest or whatever. Right. And the thing is, the reality is, is it's really difficult to do that. And it's really hard to do that. And you need to have healthy, cohesive bodies that love each other to be able to think that through, um, to be able to be, you know, the light of God in the world. And I wonder if there are as many healthy bodies that love each other than we think they are. There are. I don't know. And I, I don't know how to answer that question. Neither do I. That's a disappointing place to well, end this, it. Well, no, this is sort of Augustine's city of God. It's like when Augustine says, how many people are in the city of man and how many people are actually in the city of God? We don't really know. Right. We don't really know how many people are actually in the city of God um, because it's the city of God and we don't get to see it. But so how many people are going to church but are actually in the city of man? This is something that Augustine talks about in the city of God. Right. So, I mean, it's not like it's a new thing. Um, no, that's fair. But anyway, but the, right. the, the, the warning is, and the, the actual sort of maybe theologically interesting question is, is can, a, can you take a tool, and this was the debate at the Baptist Convention, can you take a methodology of interpretation of the world that is rooted in materialism and actually use it for theologically and have it still be orthodox? And the convention said yes. The convention said yes. The Catholic Church said no. Um, and and that's sort of the big debate. Yeah. Um, so is there, yes. So anyway, is, it, is, a, is a, a heuristic that's, that sees the world as oppressed and oppressor, um, can that completely seamlessly fit into Christian theology and have it engage the culture or whatever, whatever you, thing you want to use to, to justify, to use, to use it sure. anyway yeah really big good. Yeah, fascinating real. stuff yeah. but it's um um yeah anyway that's that's antonio gramsci and yes he as he got older he ended up looking he was a very very short man mm-hmm. he was like maybe five feet and he had a big old stoop shoulders and as he got older he ended up looking either more like a frog or a turtle mm. um he kind of like sunk into himself and he was like this little short guy um this little like rip the system <laughs> you know guy so <laughs> He had crazy hair, too. That was the Great. one picture. Yes, he had crazy up. hair. Yeah. Okay, well, this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know, and good, I guess, goodbye to our listeners, both in audio and on video. This is the first, you know, it's a, it's weird. It's our first recording session with video, so hi, yeah. I guess. Yeah, next time um, we record, you'll see us in, like, different clothes. Yeah, it's <laughs> weird. It's been three weeks, and we've been wearing the same <laughs> stuff. Um, so you can check us out at classicalstuff.net. You can find our Twitter, C-L-S-S-C-A-L-Stuff. You can send us emails at theguys at classicalstuff.net. Mm-hmm. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash classicalstuff. Is that correct? That is correct. That's correct. And uh, yeah, if you feel like giving, that'd be awesome. If you don't, then you're welcome to keep listening. Like no no skin off our backs, right? Yeah. 
the more people that listen, it doesn't cost us more. So that's true. That's a, that's a positive. Um, we're glad you're listening. We really care about you guys. Uh, even though we took off kind of a long break for COVID, but I, I suppose everybody did. So it's true. Um, yeah, here's, here's our wishes going out to you and hoping that you are safe and sound and healthy and, um, secure. Cool, so for sure. be safe out there, everybody. Bye. Classical Bye. stuff signing off.